Save the World Changers. Welcome to another episode of the How to Save the World podcast. Today's guest on the show is Joseph Mascaro. He has a PhD in tropical ecology, and he probably has one of the coolest jobs in the world as the director of academic programs for an amazing company called Planet Labs. Planet Labs are a space company that have covered the Earth in over 170 small satellites that take high resolution images of the entire Earth every single day. We are going to be talking about how all this new satellite technology is helping us protect the world's ecosystems and maybe even a bit about how going to Mars just might help us here at home on Earth. Thank you so much for joining me today, Joe. Do you actually really have the coolest job in the world? <laughs> I, I feel like I have a very cool job. I think there uh, are many people actually at Planet that have cool jobs and a lot of other people at some of the other new space companies around uh, that, that also have pretty good jobs. But yeah, it's fabulous. On day to day, most of my workflow is interacting with Planet's users. So that these are the actual people taking Planet's data and putting it to practice and really uh, innovating changes around the world as a result of it. I, I get to interact with them, understand their, their research and their workflows and how our data from space can help actually like improve life on earth. And what does Planet Labs do that's so special? I know that you put satellites into the atmosphere that take high resolution photos, but could you explain why it's why that is so unique? Yeah, sure. So over the past 40 years, many governments including the government of the United States have invested in earth observation satellites. Uh, we've been have we've had a program running called the Landsat program that dates back to the 70s. And that program is powered by satellites. The latest one flying is called Landsat 8. It's about the size of a, a city bus. It's more than a billion dollar satellite. And this satellite is specifically designed to watch the surface of the planet change over time. Where it has limitations, uh, particularly are around the, the frequency with which it can revisit the Earth. So Landsat only uh, images the same location on the Earth's surface every 16 days, so about every two weeks. And it only sees things that are 30 meters in size. So one pixel in Landsat is 30 meters across. That, that's going to be several buildings in some cases. And what Planet has done is, is take a, an approach of, we have a similar orbital approach. So we're, we're, we're flying relatively close by Landsat, but, but we have more than 170 satellites orbiting the Earth in such a way that we're able to revisit the same location every day. I mean, in fact, sometimes even twice a day. We also can see things quite a bit sharper. So Landsat, I mentioned, is the size of a city bus. Our satellites are, are not much bigger than a, than a loaf of bread, and yet uh, they image the Earth in pixels that are only um, between three and four meters in size. So as a result, we can see changes in, in buildings. For example, there were some buildings, uh, homes damaged in the recent California fires up in Santa Rosa and Napa, and we're able to res resolve those changes. We actually have images just a couple of days before the fire and shortly thereafter. And so this information can potentially be used to make decision making in near real time. I think one of the challenges with Landsat, for example, is that if you detect something changing, there's a lag that prevents you from making decisions in a rapid fashion where you could actually improve people's lives and, and improve the welfare of ecosystems. And so with a really, really high frequency revisit capability and a sharper resolution pixel, Planet's system is set up to, to do that kind of decision making. And so what was it like for social impact organizations and environmental conservation organizations before they didn't have this type of imagery? What were the struggles that they were having that, that, that you're solving? Yeah, let me give you an example. So one of our partners is an organization called the Amazon Conservation Association. This is a nonprofit entity headquartered in DC. Their primary focus is around threats to forests and forest resources in the Andean region of uh, the Amazon. So this is sort of the Western Amazon basin. They mostly work in Peru and Ecuador. They're tracking, among other things, some illegal gold mining activity that occurs inside the Tambopata National Reserve. This is a big, sort of like a national park in southern Peru. They had a uh, historically have had a number of challenges, one of, one of which is that it's very cloudy in Peru. So they, even when you collect images from Landsat or other freely available earth observation sensors, your ability to image those forests in a timely fashion that allows you to actually intervene is pretty restricted. With our imagery, they were able to get a look. In some cases, they can see what's going on yesterday in these forests that are under threat from this gold mining. And that allows them to engage uh, with policymakers, decision makers, and journalists and, and sort of tell the story in a way that's near real time. It's the, the information from space is coming into the hands of decision makers in such a way where when they, they have the ability to act very quickly. In that case, there has been some action taken in, in this particular forest reserve
reserve in southern Peru that has reduced, uh, dramatically reduced some of the gold mining intrusion that's taken place over the past couple of years. What are they actually seeing when, when I see the images in, in respect to the gold mine? In this case, uh, these are, they're called artisanal mines. Uh, you can think of it kind of like panning for gold on steroids. There are large camps of workers. These are relatively dangerous areas with a lot of nefarious activity. So labor trafficking and sex trafficking are common in these types of encampments. The miners are using a series of pumps and generators. They basically are moving water and and slurry. This is like uh, rock and soil material around and they passing it over uh, mercury, just like panning for gold and trying to pull out gold flakes. So we can see on a day-to-day basis, we can see the advancement of of the, the front, the leading edge of the mine, as it moves into this particular forest reserve. You can even make out you know, specific tents and, and structures that are, uh, that are created by the miners. This gives situational awareness to Peruvian authorities and, uh, and like I said, the media, journalists in this case, to understand where people are at any given time and if there are people that are encroaching upon a forest reserve boundary where it's unequivocally illegal for them to be mining there then the government can intervene. And you've actually seen tangible successes from this environmental NGO being able to see these images. Yeah, one of our one of our earliest wins was a series of reporting. It was done by a Peruvian newspaper called El Comercio. And this was in collaboration with the Amazon Conservation Association, our, our partner in Peru. And Basically, our images were investigated by journalists and government representatives. And then very shortly thereafter, they sent in intervention to remove illegally sited mining equipment. I do want to emphasize that no one was harmed in any of this intervention, but um, they did go in and remove some illegally sited equipment. And you basically, you could draw a straight line from the observation from space that allowed this change to take place and then the change really taking place on the ground. That's just really so exciting to see how getting more of this technology is really help, helping change happen. I mean, before this was around, I mean, how did environmental organizations figure this stuff out? Hmm. I mean, it must have been really hard for them to know what was going on. Yeah, you know, I think this is such a diverse landscape, and I, I don't want to suggest that, that planet is sort of the end-all solution here. There are lots of uh, changes taking place when it comes to monitoring the surface of the earth and intervening in how we manage ecosystems. But let me give you one specific example where I think planet's innovation has changed the way we can do intervention from space. Right now, planet's lab is set up in such a way where we're able to manufacture approximately 20 satellites in one week, which is a staggering uh, high speed uh, manufacturing. And you had that facility. little too, right? They're like, what do you say, the size of a toaster or yeah, a shoebox? Yeah. They are pretty small. They're about the yeah. size of a, a loaf of bread. So they're actually 10 by 10 centimeters by 30 centimeters deep. So I want to contrast that with an example from more classic aerospace approaches. Now, the, the satellites I'm going to mention are, are different from planet satellites, so I'm not suggesting they're equivalent, but I want you to give you a context of the amount of time and the amount of resources it takes to, to intervene when it comes to the climate system or ecosystems. So a particular satellite of interest was called the uh, Orbiting Carbon Observatory. And this was a uh, NASA-funded mission. It was selected in 2002. And the purpose of the mission is to measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere from space. Now, this is the thing we do from Mauna Loa Observatory, where you see the kind of classic hockey stick uh, graph of increasing carbon dioxide. NASA essentially said, okay, we, we like this mission. This is a great mission. We're going to fund it. They funded it to the tune of approximately $270 million over, over a multi-year period. It took about seven years for that satellite to get built and launched. And it, it actually took a launch attempt in 2009. That launch attempt failed, uh, which can happen in aerospace. We've, we've seen that over the past couple of years. Planet so when you say launch attempt failed, does that mean dramatic crashing rocket exploding <laughs> in the air? Yeah, in this case, you know, the, the drama was, was muted because there was no footage of it, but this particular rocket, the fairing failed to separate. So this is a piece of the rocket that protects the satellite from the, from the atmosphere as it's entering mm. orbit. The fairing failed to separate, and so the satellite was too heavy, and, and it, it essentially crashed in the Pacific Ocean. And then a, a follow-on mission was authorized, and now at an increased cost, they actually they made a basically a copy of the satellite. They bought a more expensive rocket, which they deemed to be a little bit safer, and that out the door was on the order of uh, almost five hundred million dollars. So now you're talking about something like seven hundred fifty million dollars. It took another five years to build the replacement and get it to space and deploy it successfully. So that was from two thousand two to two thousand fourteen. It took twelve years for this particular instrument to get into space. By contrast. 
U.S., Planet's entire company dates back to 2009. So we're only roughly eight years old, and we've deployed more than 200 satellites successfully into space. When you look at the venture capital investment in Planet, uh, you can look at these public records, but it's significantly lower than $750 million. I attribute the some of the key innovations here are our planet's manufacturing approach, which we call agile aerospace. So the idea is just like with smartphone technology, where you see a new device on the market very quickly and you see iterative changes in those devices moving forward month after month after month, Planet similarly is able to innovate. We design satellites, uh, our team deploys them to space, we test them in space, learn where things went well and where things went poorly, make changes and then innovate new satellites. And we can do that extraordinarily quickly. We're able to interact with and understand how the surface of the planet is changing, ecosystems around the earth are changing with our satellites at the same pace at which those changes are taking place. So the Orbiting Carbon Observatory was a great idea, but in the 12 years it took to get Orbiting Carbon Observatory into orbit, the actual amount of CO2 in the atmosphere caused by humans went up by 20%. So the problem got 20% worse, all while the idea behind monitoring that problem uh, was moving through the sort of process of manufacturing and deployment through the kind of classic approach to aerospace. Well, it shows that taking this Silicon Valley you know, hacker approach to solving technology problems shows that we, we can actually, there are a lot of technologies that I think that are just available to us, that it takes the right person at the right time, putting the right pieces together, and it can come true. I have a cute little story about actually the early days of Planet Labs. When I first moved to Silicon Valley, I was living in a hacker house in Atherton, and I was sitting down, and it was really, literally my first two weeks ever being in Silicon Valley. It's just so much more advanced than where Australia, where I'd come from. And I was sitting down next to my friend, my new friend, whose name was um, Nato. He co- and I said, oh, your name's Nato? I used to get called Kato Potato. And he was like, I used to get called Nato Potato. And we were just like instantly <laughs> friends. And I said, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm working on building the first software for a satellite company that makes really like discount satellite. And I just thought it was the coolest thing that had ever happened to me. I just thought, oh my God, I can't believe I'm sitting next to a person who's writing code to send a discount satellite that's going to take real-time photos of the earth. And the company has just started. And then I've just slowly from a distance watched Planet Labs grow from that time, that early time in Silicon Valley into this amazing company. But it's just so, it's incredible what you see people do in Silicon Valley over a few short years. You can just see something like that that happen, which I think is just, is so impressive. I wanted to ask you about other sorts of things that the satellites can measure too. You've got forests, glaciers, desertification, paved surfaces. I've got a list here, rivers, reefs, and probably sea level rise. I mean, are there other more examples you have of being able to see all these different environmental changes in the earth? In my short time at Planet, the thing I've learned is that Planet's approach to remote sensing is so novel that in many cases, there are things that no one at Planet anticipated that we're now able to do or at least become possible. One example is we are working with some hydrologists and these are people that study high latitude ecosystems in the Arctic and Antarctic, mostly in the Arctic, where you have uh, rivers that undergo these very um, dramatic seasonal changes. You know, they're frozen all winter, then in the summer they thaw out. The pace and the behavior with which they thaw out is is kind of relevant to how we understand climate change to be impacting Earth's ecosystems. And what we discovered is that um, because of planet's orbital approach, there are instances in the high latitudes, especially where we have several images per day of the same location. So as actually one of our external research partners, in this case, it was a person from the University of Oslo, a guy named Andy Cobb, who pointed out to us that we have images separated by only 60 seconds that show the movement of ice debris in these rivers. So you can imagine you have one image and then an image 60 seconds later, and you can see the same individual blocks of ice He's able to align those images and he basically measures the distance and the time between the movement of the blocks of ice um, from one time to the next. And he can tell you the velocity that that river is moving. And this potentially allows you to understand things like the amount of water exiting these, uh, these high latitude ecosystems into the ocean as a result of glacier melt and other kinds of dynamics that are always happening in the high latitudes. For the most part, I've, I've, I've taken the approach now of uh, when I interact with university partners and researchers around the world, I'm learning from them and really everyone at Planet is as well. You know, we have many deep subject matter experts at Planet, especially when it comes to engineering and aerospace and and spacecraft manufacturing. But uh, to my knowledge, for example, there are no glaciologists at Planet. Being able to work with somebody like Andy Cobb has been fantastic because 
he's actually teaching us what, what some of the great values of our system are and how to improve those um, so we can better understand how the cryosphere and the, and the hydrosphere are responding to climate change. Because I was thinking, I was reading the article that you sent me about the ecology of Hawaii, which I understand you're an expert in. And I was thinking that there are so many different ways, so much complexity in an ecosystem in the way that you can measure it. Some of those things you won't be able to measure from the air. You'll have to measure them on the ground. Like, for example, the amount of toxic chemicals in the water. You wouldn't be able to get that from an aerial photograph. What can we see in ecosystems from these high resolution images? At first glance, I just think you can just see how much of them there are like the tree is cut down or it's there, but there must, you must be able to see more insight than just if the tree is there or not. Yeah. Oh, and what a great example. Actually, uh, one of the other really surprising things we've been able to see in forests is how trees behave over time. So there's a concept in sort of plant science called phenology. Phenology is the the temporal cadence with which plants express themselves in different ways. So for example, flowering behavior is, is a part of phenology or deciduousness when trees drop their leaves in, in, in certain types of ecosystems. Uh, we actually have a couple of partners that are looking at how they, they literally can see tropical trees flowering during dry season in, in places like uh, Colombia or, or Peru. An entire tree crown will essentially drop all of its leaves and then over, uh, over a series of days will spectacularly bloom with purple or yellow flowers and we can see those crowns jump out and these flowering events are very short-lived you know they may only last a, a couple of days or a week and because planet system has such high frequency observation we're, we're generally able to capture these events this is totally new science when it comes to ecology, forest ecology. Although we've had past observations of flowers, um, being able to see them and their behavior over vast regions potentially allows us to understand things about community ecology, the, the actual theoretical mechanisms that explain how trees are distributed around the surface of the earth, why are certain forests more diverse than other forests? And those kinds of studies have been uh, some of the most exciting that Planet's been involved in. Because when I remember just doing Introduction to Ecology at university, we just had to mark out quadrants on the ground and then we would have to count them. This is probably like really, I don't know, like old, old school, not, not very <laughs> advanced, but we just had to like count all of the species and then like estimate the foliage cover. But I was just thinking that our perspective, I mean, unless we put like a, a drone up there or something, we're really looking at the ecology from the ground up because we walk on the ground, right? But you would get such a different perspective, like you said, of like the flowering trees. Being able to see the top of the trees gives you a totally different lens for watching the ecosystem. Yeah, I, you know, another one, think for a moment of uh, looking at Google Earth, for example. We, we've not really seen remote sensing imagery from satellites in the winter. In truth, you know, there, there's there's then imagery of, of the snow covered portion of the earth. I mean, you do see that imagery if you go into the Landsat archive or the Sentinel program, but the imagery that we put onto consumer mapping services like, like Google is historically selected for kind of the brightest, you know, most visually pleasing period of the year. And in planet data, you know, we're able suddenly to look at all of snow-covered Canada in the middle of the winter and potentially understand how ecosystems are behaving temporally relevant to those um, or with respect to those particular seasonal dynamics. That's one aspect of Planet's approach that's been really intriguing to me that we are kind of we're imaging all the time in an unbiased way. So even when the Canadian Rockies are covered in snow, uh, Planet's still imaging those those ecosystems and we can potentially see things that, that other sensors wouldn't be able to see. And how has that changed your attitude? It may have not changed it at all to climate change. I mean, I ask this because I, I never emotionally bonded with climate change as an issue, even though I've always done sustainability my whole life, until I saw photographs of ice cover by year melting. You know, I could look at the charts and the numbers and I'd be like, yeah, CO2 up to 380, whatever. But it was, yeah. the, it was the images that made me really realise that it was real. I mean, since you're looking at these images and around this, has that changed something for you about your attitude to climate change? It absolutely does. Uh, the ones that really jump out to me are images of the calving faces of glaciers. So this is the part of a glacier that meets the ocean where the ice is actually breaking off and entering the ocean. Uniquely, planets able to image these areas every day in such a way that we can build up a time series. It's like a flip book or like an animation 
and you can you can watch a glacier move and it looks just like a river like as though you're though you were on a camping trip as a child and you sat on a rock next to a river and watched the water go by from our from our perch in space we're able to actually see glaciers flowing just like rivers and I, it's been especially rewarding to me as a scientist who's focused almost all of my career on tropical ecosystems in the warmest part of the world but i've always been interested in in sort of all manner of how ecosystems are affected and being able to connect with a lot of these researchers in the in the cryosphere the part of the earth that's covered in snow and ice all the time has kind of opened me up to a new perspective and and that i think the most striking thing has been those animations where, where you you begin to understand a glacier's the unique time signature I would put it like, you know, humans live, give or take, uh, you know, 80, 90 years, depending on what, what part of the world you live in. Mayflies, on the other hand, live, you know, in their adult stage, at least for like 24 hours. Organisms often have a different, a difficult time understanding the time dimension for their counterparts. You know, I have a hard time imagining what it's like to be a long-lived tropical tree that might live to be 1,600 years old or 1,500 years old. And by the same I've token... I've never tried to imagine <laughs> that before. <laughs> You know, by the same token, you know, a glacier, I have visited glaciers and I understand that they are in motion because I, I feel I've been educated in that regard. But being able to actually see it from space is, is unique. It relates to this phenomenon that's called the overview effect. You know, this is something that astronauts talk about the, the kind of emotional experience they have with seeing the earth from a totally different vantage point. I think it changes your spatial perspective on reality. And with planets approach, it changes your temporal perspective on reality. You begin to understand how uh, dynamic systems behave over long periods of time, because just like with a time-lapse video, you can, you can watch them on a kind of different temporal axis. It's really fascinating. I mean, there's two really interesting points that, um, that you touch on there. The first one is that I remember speaking Speaking to people who are, who are older than me and their experience in the sustainability movement, they would recall when the first images that we'd ever had of the earth came mm -hmm. out, that that made some sort of change in everything because nobody had ever seen, like we, we take it for granted that we can see a photo of the whole earth now. And there was a time then that had never existed. We just took it for granted that, that something shifted in our perspective of having to care for this blue marble sort of hanging by its delicate self out there, out there in space. The other point is that a woman that I interviewed a few weeks back, she's a behavioral psychologist, and we were talking about that time dimension in our consciousness towards environmental issues. And she said that people have different sorts of long-term and short-term, just natures in their thinking. People that are generally more successful and happier have a long-term perspective that they'll sacrifice the short-term in order to preserve the long-term. And some people are just very short-term focused. They're kind of like, eat the chocolate cake now, don't worry about the future. But our conversation moved into this bigger realm of just how our culture gets us to think about time. And she was Chinese and she said thinking about eons of time in terms of a thousand years is kind of normal in her background and her education. And we need to kind of start thinking long-term and it's proven in behavioral science as well that the more long-term we can think, the more environmentally conscious we become. With Planet Labs, there's the more images that we can have of the Earth, the more we can get our head around these larger time frames. And it seems perfectly rational to make short-term sacrifices like, oh, let's get rid of using fossil fuels for keeping our Earth here for a, and healthier for a long time. Yeah, you know, I think that's a fascinating insight. I'm, myself, I've had this, I've had a similar track record when it comes to my scientific background. You mentioned your first, like, emotional experience with climate change. And for me, I was very interested in science, like, throughout my whole academic career. I do remember my personal aha moment with climate change. And it, it was not so much related to, you know, new pieces of evidence about humanity's effects on the globe, as it was my own understanding of the geologic history of the earth, that the climactic changes that have happened over very long periods of time. One in particular that was that has really stuck with me, this will get briefly technical, but relates to these series of cycles that are called Milankovitch cycles. These are the cycles that determine, among other things, ice ages. If you've had this common experience of going to a public museum or a natural history museum, I think often most very well-educated people have a perception of the Ice Age as an event in the recent past, you know, with saber-toothed tigers and other kinds of things. But what we have learned 
is that the, the thing we colloquially refer to as the Ice Age is actually only one of, of several, uh, something like 30, glacial periods. And these are, these are periods that are relatively short, geologically speaking. They're, they may last uh, you know, between 20 and 100,000 years. But we have a record, a geologic record of them operating like a clock. They go in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out. And that's the actual advance and retreat of ice sheets across the Earth's surface. What they're controlled by is the relative position of the Earth in space versus the Sun. So, for example, one of these um, cycles relates to the structure of Earth's orbit around the Sun. It, you know, the Earth's orbit is an ellipse, but it actually wobbles between being more circular and more elliptical, and more circular and more elliptical. It was once I had this contextual information that I compared the anthropogenic signal, the human signal, and saw that the different fluctuation between an ice age down here at a slightly lower temperature and no ice age above that at a slightly warmer temperature and kind of watching this go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth is only caused by a difference in CO2 concentrations of something like 80 parts per million. Right, which is how much we've, <laughs> about how much we've added? We're, we've added already more than that. So, you know, a typical ice age, a glacial period, uh, you'd have a CO2 concentration of, a, of approximately 200 parts per million. That's on the colder side. And one of these interglacial periods, which is what we're in now, a kind of relatively warm period, you'd have a CO2 concentration of around 280 parts per million. And that's what CO2 was at at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. And we're now, we've crossed 400. So we've added 120 on top of the 280. Just that 80 between 280 and 200 is the difference between a mile of ice on top of Milwaukee <laughs> and Detroit and, and Philadelphia and ice retreated back to the poles like we see today. It is important that when climate policy is discussed, we take a moment and try to work with people on contextualizing the climate system, because I think this makes people more robust to skeptics or climate denialism. If you sort of bludgeon people over and over and over in a cable news environment, and you say, you know, the world's getting hotter, the world's getting hotter, the world's getting hotter, I think you can convince people, but their support is thin because they don't have a framework or a context to evaluate the information. And I think one of the things we could do better is to do a better job of educating people and allowing people to experience what the climate history of Earth has been and, and, and the context against which these human factors can be evaluated. This makes people more robust against denialist arguments like, oh, the warming is caused by the sun. Well, in fact, we have actually decomposed, climate scientists have decomposed the solar component of modern climate change. And it is not zero, it's very tiny uh, relative to the, the part caused by carbon emissions from fossil fuel burning. But we have actively decomposed that out of the various um, changes that are taking place with Earth's climate. So that was a bit of a, a long-winded tour. But I, for me, I think you're, you're right. I think it, you know, it's important that people have a an experiential transformation without, without being bludgeoned uh, as though the, the conversation is over and they just need to kind of come along. Also, I hear you saying is just how delicate the Earth system is, that these things aren't entirely black and white, that just these small portions of CO2 emissions can have these, these big effects on the world and how interconnected all of the Earth's ecology is. I wanted to move on to something that I think is really exciting, which is turning images into machine readable data. We can use our eyes to figure out what's going on in a glacier or what's going on in a forest, but how do we turn a photograph that we can see in hex codes you know about computers, right? You know what a hex code is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm pretty sure everyone else that's listening knows. It's like, um, it's a little bit of code that tells you what color something is and how you could turn that into like a signal. You know, you could get an alert that says, okay, forest has gone down by this much or glacier moved by this. And I understand planets working on that. Where are you guys at with turning your photographs into machine readable data sources? Planet is investing heavily in the analytics right now. So imagery is a vital ingredient to decision making, but it is not by itself enough. And, and when you look at the huge volume of data, the actual raw pixels coming down from space, planets collecting right now on the order of about 300 million square kilometers of imagery per day. 
which is approximately twice as much as the whole land surface of the earth. So this, this data volume is massive. If you are a decision maker, a policy maker, if you run a commercial company, there is a certain arduousness that would be required to in, ingest and evaluate in all this information. What Planet is, is, is moving forward with is an ability to decompose that information in such a way that it's more efficient for decision making. So let me give you an example from Tropical Forests. The burning, the clearing of tropical forests around the world accounts for on the order of one fifth or a little bit below one fifth of all carbon emissions to the atmosphere. So the climate change problem uh, is caused by a number of factors, cars and, and smokestacks, but the emission from deforestation is, is actually pretty substantial. It's, it's bigger than the whole transportation sector. I just want to make sure I got that right. Did yeah. you say that deforestation, the burning of forests accounts for one fifth of carbon pollution? Yeah, it's, and it's more than transportation. It's more than the entire global transportation sector. Right, yeah. so we should really care about trees <laughs> not getting cut down. It's Which I think major. we all do. I think we all care. We all I do. Care. I do think we all care. Yeah, absolutely. Where we run into a challenge on the monitoring side of that is that it is difficult from current data to detect the difference between the burning of one type of forest versus another type. So what I'm specifically getting at here is on an aerial basis, on a per hectare basis, or sort of for a given unit of land area, if you burn a very high carbon density forest, like a forest that stores 200, 250, 300 tons of carbon per hectare, which is really on the high side, you've got a much bigger emission per unit area than a, a shorter statured or a, a maybe a drier forest where the carbon emission might only be 50 tons or 60 tons. The underlying physical factor that causes that difference is literally the size of the trees. Big trees store more carbon. It's just like if you're filling a vase with water, a larger vase is going to store a great deal more water than a smaller one. Planet through, through Partners is working on methods to understand the differences in the, in the relative sizes of the trees in our imagery. So what we're trying to do is essentially break down the images and we'll say, okay, over here with machine vision and analytics and other tools, you know, over here we have a set of trees that are fairly large with very big tree crowns. And therefore we think based on ground data or field data that there's X amount of carbon per hectare in this particular parcel of land. And we can contrast that with areas where we see much smaller trees. And the goal is to eliminate take the imagery out of the decision-making process, build an analytic method that is robust enough where we can see the, we can essentially predict the amount of carbon in a particular forest based on the relative sizes of the trees, then give you an accurate estimate of how much is emitted to the atmosphere if that forest is cleared or burned. And how, how are you going with that? Is that something that you think is, will be achieved in the near future? I think or is, we, it, or is it incredibly difficult to do? <laughs> it's a, you know, it's a tricky research question. I'm fairly confident. I'll tell you the reason I'm confident is that, you know, my own personal academic background is, is in tropical ecology, as you mentioned. When I, when I made the vase example, that what I'm really getting at is that there is actually an underlying physical property that determines the amount of carbon that can be stored inside a an organism like a tree, and it is directly correlated with the, with the diameter of that tree and, and the height and, and a few other factors. But the diameter, the reason for that is, is literally that the amount of water that can move through the, the stem of the tree follows the same kind of mathematical restrictions that the amount of water that can move through a pipe follows. We have very good uh, scientific backing for the, the relationship between the sizes of the trees and this, this carbon stock, the, the amount of carbon that would be emitted to the atmosphere. It's just a question of doing the work to linking those two data sets in such a way where the, the thing you can spit out the other end is an estimate of the actual carbon emission to the atmosphere. So you can actually create an algorithm that scans an image and can see something that's meaningful, take that data and turn that into a database or something that a computer can read or signal. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. You recently wrote an article about saying that in order to protect Earth, we need to go to Mars. And it's a, it's a contentious issue going to Mars because in the Silicon Valley scene, people are really into Mars. And in the more traditional environmental or social change scene, it's the most ridiculous idea on the planet. <laughs> Excuse the pun. But you use this term called lateral innovation, which I'd never heard that term before. Can you explain why we need lateral innovation and what your, what your point is around that? Let me say that 
as a person who I consider myself a conservationist and a scientist, obviously, I understand the resistance to going to Mars. I, the, there's an argument out there that basically says, we have plenty of problems right here on Earth. We really need to focus our attention here where we live, uh, the only habitable planet that we're aware of at the moment, before we start doing what people would consider ridiculous things like, like attempting to settle Mars or to go and live permanently on Mars. I find that that argument is compelling on a gut level, but when you start to decompose it, 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 it begins to fall apart. Where it relates to technology specifically is that there are approaches to solving problems that run the risk of occluding potentially really creative or novel ideas. An example of that is um, that's related to Mars has to do with, with mitigating climate change, literally uh, dealing with the high amount of carbon dioxide into the in the atmosphere. So when you look at some of the very serious proposals for getting to Mars, and uh, I would cite the, uh, the SpaceX mission architecture or the Blue Origin mission architecture, notice a couple of key features common to both architectures. One is the both of these engines that SpaceX and Blue Origin are developing, I'm talking about the Raptor engine and the BE-4, which is the Blue Origin engine, they're both powered by liquid methane and liquid oxygen. And that is not an accident. They're structured that way because both Elon and Bezos and their counterparts believe that the best way to do a round trip to Mars is to get to Mars and then make the fuel for the return trip on the Martian surface. And what the, the method that they've decided to employ involves essentially taking CO2 out of the Martian atmosphere. The Martian atmosphere happens to be mostly carbon dioxide, but basically taking CO2 out of the Martian atmosphere and breaking it down, reacting it with a little bit of hydrogen, which allows you to sort of pair the carbon with hydrogen, you're going to get methane, and then you have oxygen also from the CO2. If I were to describe that technology to you on Earth, it would be called carbon capture and sequestration. It is literally the, the extraction of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in putting it into, a, a, in this case, a, a couple of different liquids, but you know, in a storable form. Using the same chemical approaches on Earth that you would use on Mars, right now, those approaches would be very expensive. They're not the best way at present to mitigate the carbon pollution in the atmosphere. But what I'm suggesting is that by allowing for and in fact nurturing a unique innovation pipeline related to carbon capture and sequestration on Mars, the possibility that you stumble upon innovations that could be relevant here on Earth is very high. It's high for a couple of reasons. The most important reason probably is that you have different types of people approaching a problem. You might find that people working at SpaceX working on decomposing CO2 out of the Martian atmosphere are people with either deep experience in chemistry or deep experience in engineering. They may not be people that have historically been focused on mitigating climate change, which means they might have come out of academic or other career paths that are totally different than those people that are working on carbon capture and sequestration on Earth, which is very much a kind of climate mitigation technology. I think in the, in the latter camp, you know, you're going to run into people that have been working on innovating solar cells or innovating wind turbines. You're capturing people from different walks of life that approach problem solving in different ways. The possibility of a true kind of unique innovation is, I think, in my opinion, going to be higher if you have different people approaching the same problem, but from totally different angles. The challenges on Mars are unique to Mars, but they're not totally separate from Earth. They're, they're highly correlated. So when you attempt to approach them in a Martian context, you may innovate things that, that could be relevant on Earth without realizing it. The steps that you're going to take to try and innovate uh, how you would engineer crops to grow in Martian soil under a Martian atmosphere or something like a Martian atmosphere are going to cause you to go through a creative process and an innovative process that you that you may not go through if you're simply trying to grow crops in arid environments on Earth. Well, what I got from your article that I thought was different to what you usually hear about the Mars thing was what you've been saying that in this type of innovation hive that we get in, in the Bay Area and in Silicon Valley, you're going to attract different types of people, which might, I think, sound like, I don't know, it might sound like a soundbite, but when we look back earlier in our conversation talking about how Planet Labs got off the ground, it really started with a few people in a garage that within a few short years did have done something pretty incredible. And that kind of thing is happening all the time around here. So I feel like I'm constantly witnessing firsthand people doing exactly that, coming with a very creative form of 
technology and science and applying it to problems that you are not going to get working in a traditional way, like, you know, how you talked about the satellite that took $700 million to build and crashed the first time. I mean, <laughs> that's more of the, the old school government government way of doing things that is not necessarily going to get us where we need to go. I think my only conflict with the Mars thing is where people come up with really silly explanations for why we should go to Mars. Mm. Ridiculous explanations like, don't worry when we use up all the resources on Earth. Once we kill Earth, we will go to Mars. Mm. And I'm just like, are you serious? Or yeah, stuck, well, we'll go to Mars and then we'll find the cure to cancer and bring it back because it will be in an ancient bacteria in the rock. And I'm like, guys, these are not good. These are not good reasons. I think those two, I agree with you, are particularly terrible. I actually, um, you know, the idea of Mars as an escape, and it's sort of like a, a lifeboat, is uh, I think a very poor and dangerous one. And when you look, I think the serious people that talk about going to Mars, you know, if you if you dig into what Elon Musk says beyond the talking points, so go to, for example, there's a whole series, a wonderful series at waitbutwhy.com about why Elon wants to make life multiplanetary and specifically to settle Mars. And it is unambiguously not to escape. First of all, it's about an urgent need to back up to essentially have a, a second initially second human civilization, but ultimately a second biosphere, a place where life can exist in such a way that we're, that life as we know it is no longer vulnerable to a catastrophe. And he's not talking about human caused catastrophes exclusively. He's also talking about natural catastrophes that we may not be able to avoid things like asteroid impacts or the explosion of a neutron star or something like that. When you, when you approach it from that point of view, this also allows you to, to bring the rest of life into the, into the loop. You know, when Elon Musk says he wants to make life multiplanetary, he's not talking just about human life. He's talking about life. Uh, this is where as an ecologist, I feel the most native enthusiasm about going to Mars, you know, when you consider it for a moment, right now, life on Earth, let's characterize that life on Earth is, as far as we know, the only life in the universe at present, uh, that is life we're aware of, has a finite existence here. Whether you want to refer to a potential asteroid impact in the near future or not, or deal with what humanity may do that, that could damage or could revitalize Earth's ecosystems, those challenges are vital and urgent. But we are in a situation where within the next roughly 600 to 800 million years, life on Earth as we know it will come to an end. And it will be because the sun's energy output has increased enough that it becomes essentially too, too hot on the surface of the Earth to maintain a biosphere that is even remotely similar to the one we have. So when you look at the, at the future 800 million years out, it will be almost impossible for vascular plants to exist on the surface of the Earth. Essentially, the whole biosphere as we know it will collapse. Um, That's a long time out. <laughs> but, and, but does that mean if the Earth, if it's if the sun's going to get hotter, does that mean other planets further out are going to become warmer? Does that make other planets more potentially habitable? It, it will, yeah. And I, Some of them are just frozen gas, aren't they? Won't they just <laughs> evaporate? Well, right. I mean, right. I can't remember which one is which, but won't Jupiter just evaporate? Yeah, there's well, there's all these interesting ideas. Actually, some of them, there's a science fiction piece by, I think it was Stephen Baxter that uh, talks about a thing called the Titan Summer, which is where this moon of, of Saturn, Titan, today is, is nearly as cold as absolute zero. I mean, it's ridiculously cold. It's covered with frozen ethane and all kinds of bizarre stuff where, you know, four billion years from now when the sun swells into a red giant and undergoes this senescence of, of death that briefly Titan will heat up and become and become kind of a balmy tropical location. To back up, I mean, what I'm getting at here is that when we think about the need to go to Mars, I don't think it's fair to think about it exclusively from the point of view of human civilization today. I think it's much more relevant to think about it from the point of view of the history of evolution of life. Organisms have been living on the earth for something like 3.8, 3.9 billion years. We've gone through this immensely complex and beautiful process of evolving new types of organisms, new approaches to existing. All of the biosphere, every organism on earth right now is 
in the same boat when it comes to this long-term senescence of the Earth's biosphere. So if you care about conservation, just think about this for a moment, approach how you think about the morality of conservation for things like orangutans or the great apes or tropical forests of the world or endangered frogs in Peru. I think the extent to which we care about this is multifaceted, but one of the reasons I care about it is that I intrinsically value nature. And I think a lot of people that care about conservation intrinsically value nature. Take a moment to let it sink in that life as we know it is destined to come to an end unless we become multiplanetary. When I say we, I mean life. At the moment- I, I hate thinking about it. I just, <laughs> it's, it's too, it's too yeah, weird. It's, it's, quite a, it's quite a jarring uh, thought, but- I just, Geological but time freaks me out. I just, yeah. anything over a thousand years, I can't handle. But what's, what's unique about us, about humans, is that uh, with the exception of some microorganisms, we're the only organisms that are capable right now of interplanetary travel. Now, you know, there are microorganisms that are probably on the surfaces of some of the probes that we've sent around the solar system that many of them may have gone into kind of a dormant state. So I'm not saying we're the only thing that can live outside the earth. But what I'm saying is that we're the only thing alive on earth, the only species alive on earth that has the ability, the technology, the wherewithal and the drive to go elsewhere. When we go elsewhere, we're going to need the other organisms around us in order to create something like the biosphere that we have on earth. And it's not going to be anything like the biosphere on earth. It will be totally unique. But it will involve, for example, making decisions about which organisms we should take to Mars. Uh, we'll want crops, uh, you know, we'll need probably lichens and bryophytes and other rugged, small plant-like organisms that can photosynthesize in really cold, really arid environments. Eventually, we'll probably deal with challenges related to trees. You know, will we want to modify the Martian environment by growing forests and, and kind of kicking off the evolution of new ecosystems on Mars? I'm fascinated with how humanity and the rest of uh, the organisms that we share this planet with will confront these challenges in the future. That for me as an ecologist is the most exciting and challenging question when it comes to terraforming Mars or, or you know, altering the Martian environment to make it more habitable. And that leads beautifully into my favorite question that I like to ask everybody is what is the one thing that deeply moves you about what you do that really gets your toes tingling and eyes bulging in excitement? <laughs> oh my gosh. I like feel a like special thing. I feel like there's so many. I think for me, it is the, it is the intersection of science and the human experience and especially art. One of the unique things about Planet is that Planet has an, an art director, a guy named Forrest Stearns. He now runs an artist in residence program, but early in Planet's history, one of the things he was doing was putting art on each of Planet's satellites. So all the every one of our small satellites in space, they all carry artwork. A couple of months ago, Forrest led an exercise with a group of elementary school students. It was this wonderful delightful experience because we, we essentially brought in, we did a science fair in our lab for these students. They were mostly third graders and fourth graders. So they learned about rockets. They learned how satellites get made. And then Forrest ran an exercise where they all did a piece of art. Two of those pieces were selected to fly on Dove spacecraft, on planet spacecraft. One of them, which was done by a student named Sidney Liu, was a letter to astronauts. It was a piece of art. It basically said, dear astronauts, how are you doing and how much longer are you going to be in space? And Sydney's piece was one of the two that was selected and it was attached to the side of a Dove spacecraft. And a couple of weeks ago, it launched on a Minotaur C rocket from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Could you and, imagine how sweet that would be? Like being a child? Sorry, I, I don't uh, remember how old you said the kids were. They were in third um, and fourth grade. So yeah, so they're, they're children. Pretty young, But yeah. just knowing that you got to do that, like how that oh, would yeah. catalyze your imagination. So I was just drawing in like little <laughs> books, you know, for my on my shelf. I mean, Forrest, uh, a few months before that, one of Forrest did an art night at planet he does this pretty regularly and one of um, one of my drawings was sent to space and i must tell you this was it was like being struck by lightning i mean it was amazing <laughs> what excites me most about this and this also relates to why we need to go to mars is that in my opinion having an exploration frontier one that's really led by humans not just robots 
and probes is that I believe inspiration is vital to the human experience and vital to the future of science and conservation. And the reason for that is that in my opinion, exploration translates down to younger ages than many other disciplines in science. So for example, if you have bring your mother to school day and your mom is an astronaut, (laughs) kids go crazy for that. And by comparison, a person who's an oncologist is equally, if not more vital for human welfare right now. But the concept of being an oncologist is not as natively translatable to young people. That is, it's, I think it's more difficult to imagine a third grader and a fourth grader being inspired to go into oncology, because I think a lot of the concepts are more difficult to, to wrap your head around the idea of, of, of entering into that kind of role when you're a young person. Whereas exploration is, I sometimes call it nakedly positive. I think in, you know, in human history, exploration has not been nakedly positive. In fact, it's been one of the, the most challenging and at sometimes really horrific things that we've done. But by going to Mars, where we know that you know, we'll be the first, certainly the first sentient beings to be there, I think we can say that with certainty, we have an opportunity to build a civilization on an exploration frontier in a way that, in my opinion, is, is nakedly positive. There's a lot of challenges we're going to face there, but it, by stepping forward and actually doing something really forward-looking, we can, uh, we can do that in such a way that is, I think, going to be really inspiring and really important. And I think it's going to translate to young people in a, such a way that you're likely to see more people people pursue careers in science. Those people are going to, as they get older, make decisions about what kind of science they want to pursue. You're going to see them enter the workforce or scientific disciplines, many, if not the overwhelming majority of which will be focused on improving the welfare of life on earth or human life on earth or animal life on earth. Yeah. And I think what you're getting at, which is something I'm extremely passionate about, I've really devoted my my life to it, which is transforming the perspective of sustainability into something enormously positive and creative and inspiring. This book I've been writing, How to Save the World, I've got a little introduction in it where I talk about what it was like growing up in the 90s, where everything was just, it felt so dire, like the forests were dying, the climate change, you know, Nike was a terrible corporation. It was extremely negative. And even in the early professional sustainability industry, it was all just this terrible things are happening to the world. We have to stop all the terrible, terrible things. And I just didn't want to have my headspace around that. I, When I imagine the future, I imagine thriving green cities I, I still have this like science fiction this kind of eco utopia vision in my in my mind that's like high tech and beautiful and covered in green walls and I think that's what really gets me going about, about it why does the whole movement about having try, trying to make the world a better place have to be this dire miserable existence shouldn't it be the height of creativity the height of innovation. So I think it doesn't just the concept that you're sharing doesn't need to be just space. I think when you think about how we can feed people, how we can design buildings, how we can get around, it can all be inspirational and and exciting. Saving the world doesn't need to be some miserable fight against the, the horrible enemy. I totally agree. I couldn't agree more. You're right that it, it's not it's not just about Mars, but you know, again, as an ecologist, the thing that is the most troubling is how much of ecology is focused on what ecosystems used to be like before humanity started screwing them up. And although there is a lot of truth to that, uh, (laughs) that is, we have done an enormous amount of damage to ecosystems around the earth. I don't think it is wise that ecology focus on things like restoration exclusively, because I think that the concept of trying to recreate an ecosystem that once existed is not as helpful as the concept of trying to imagine how to make ecosystems that are new or revitalize and make ecosystems more resilient to future changes. A quick example of this uh, from coral reef ecology that's kind of exciting is that, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges with coral reefs when it comes to climate change is that um, the uh, these events, these bleaching events are caused by basically the expulsion of the, the coral animals have these um, dinoflagellate algae that live inside the coral. And when it gets too hot, the dinoflagellate algae leave, they kind of abandon the coral hosts, and then the corals starve. But there are dinoflagellate algae in certain waters that can tolerate higher temperatures. And one of the really exciting pieces of research that's going on is trying to figure out if we can find and cultivate those, those more uh, kind of more robust dinoflagellate algae in such a way that they could help other coral species deal with warming temperatures. 
And it's very prospective thinking. It's sort of like, okay, we know that the ocean conditions are now permanently changed or they're changed for the next many centuries, even if we do the best we can imagine at mitigating climate change. So under that scenario, how can we ensure that coral reefs uh, maintain their, their kind of fundamental existence, even though we know that it might be different, um, that, that they may have to behave and, and grow in, in a sort of novel way. Um, that kind of research, I think, is really smart. It's really, um, it has a clear-eyed uh, kind of understanding of where we are with respect to climate change and, and um, the kind of welfare of the biosphere right now. And getting more ecologists to think, think in that way, that sort of like, how could I build something? How can I help these organisms that I want to conserve have the mechanisms and the machinery and the kind of like literal enzymes that they would need to tolerate and deal with new environmental conditions? Because when I think about the ecology, I think of it as a as a continuum. It's not like ecosystems developed until now, or this word that you use called the, it's not just your word, the Anthropocene, till it comes and put a big line in the sand. And now everything from here is terrible. I mean, it's, and the way I see humans and technology are very much part of evolution. The evolution isn't necessarily, isn't ecology, just all the ecology is being destroyed, but they're, they're changing and they're different to rather see it as a, as a continuum of change rather than this horrible destruction. I think you're, I, I totally agree. <laughs> This has been an incredibly fascinating conversation. Joseph, thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope lots and lots of people listen to this because we've talked about so many, so many amazing things. It was even better than I had hoped for and I had high hopes to begin with. If you'd like to check out this interview, you can see it on the YouTube channel, How to Save the World. And also don't forget to subscribe on iTunes. Same name, How to Save the World. We have been speaking with Joseph Mascara who is a PhD ecologist from Planet Labs. Thanks so much for everybody for listening and I hope that this interview has helped turn your dreams for a better world into real and measurable change.